Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. We'll uh, get started with our service. Go ahead and uh, find your seat there, and we'll begin with some announcements. All right, well, it's good to see you all here this morning. I'm glad we can come together to worship the Lord. Um, if you're new here today, we would love to connect with you. And the best way that we do that is we have a little green check-in card, and they're in the pew racks in front of you. And you can fill those out, um, and you can either drop it in the offering plate as it goes by, or if you want to take it with you to the kiosk after service, um, we actually have a little gift bag, goodie bag for you, um, just a way to say welcome here, and um, it's an easy way for us to connect with you. So fill one of those out, and we'd love to get you uh, connected here to the church. Uh, we have a few things to cover today. The first thing I want to do, though, is we have a video for Operation Christmas Child because we're actually getting closer and closer to that time of year. So uh, we're going to play that video real quick. The uh, impactful ministry, and our church has been a part of this for a long time now, and it's, um, it's even connected us to Good Samaritan's Home Ministries in India, and it's just produced so much fruit over the years. And so um, if you're new to our church, uh, this is something we hit hard every year, and um, I encourage you guys, as we get closer and closer to November and December, to be thinking about and praying about how you can partner with this ministry. So the easiest thing to do, and you'll see it in the lobby, is take a shoebox, and you can pack that yourself. Um, you can go to the Dollar Tree or go to Walmart and get little goodies for the kids and personalize that box for your kid. Um, you can also, if you want to, you can um, buy more uh, items and donations and you can donate those items into the big box that's in the lobby there too um, and then another way that you can help out with this ministry is that you can uh, just give above and beyond financially just above your normal tithes and offerings uh, to support this ministry we have a team here at the church that um, has it you know nailed down to the t of which items to buy where to buy them get the most bang for your buck kind of a thing so um, and then Come November, we actually have a packing party here at the church um, where we pack hundreds of boxes and you'll see our stage start filling up with them. Uh, and then they'll be sent out about uh, mid-November. So we're going to be hitting this each week this month. And so we just encourage you guys to be praying about how you can um, be participating with this ministry. Uh, a few other things to announce. We've got some little stuffed items in the bulletin. Um, first is the purple card that has our uh, missionary of the month and our country of the month. Um, and that actually has Good Samaritan's Home Ministry on there. And so uh, Brother Joseph uh, in India there has an amazing ministry where he is um, working with impoverished people to bring them the gospel and to bring them education to help break that poverty cycle. Um, and, the, you know, God is doing amazing things over there. And then we have India as the country of the month, too, that we can be praying for. Um, they're number 11 on the world watch list. Um, so there's just little summaries there and just ways that you can be praying for that country and specifically for that ministry on that card. So tuck this in your Bible, um, and then whenever you open it up, it's just a good reminder to be praying for that. And then we have our prayer force alert, alert in there, too. We did make a bit of an oopsie. This is September's prayer force alert, so you guys get to be a bit ahead of the schedule. Um, next Sunday, we'll get this actual month's in there. And so um, this is really cool. It has a, a daily prayer prompt in there. Um, so each day of the month, you can be praying for um, our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who um, don't have it like we have it here in the U.S. You know, they're, they're suffering, they're being persecuted for their faith. And so this is just a way that we can be praying for them. And then a few other things to announce. We have our fasting, worship, and prayer night tomorrow night here at the church uh, at 7 o'clock. Um, so I encourage you guys to take tomorrow as a day to fast and to um, pray, not only just for yourself and your family, but also for our church, our community, and the world. Um, and then join us here at 7 o'clock as we come together to, to sing and to pray uh, together as the body. Um, we have Lake Baptisms coming up, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, August 13th. Um, that's an awesome time out at Lake Siskiyou. Brandon will talk about that just a little bit later. And then um, we have our parenting, our final kind of summer parenting conference group uh, for the summer coming up on Wednesday, August 16th from 6 to 7.30. Um, that's just a recap of a series that we went through with Paul David Tripp about parenting. And so um, if you're at all interested in that and you haven't been a part of it yet, we have all the content available so you can watch the, the, the lessons on that. I think they'll be discussing the third session for that one. Um, but that'll be here at the church on that Wednesday, and there's childcare available for that. And so if you have kids, uh, sign up at the lobby just so we have an idea of uh, whose kids are coming for that. All right, that is all we have for announcements, uh, and I'm going to have Jenny Weed come up and do our scripture reading for us. So if I could have you guys stand up, and she will uh, read the word of God for us.
Okay, we're reading Psalm 27, a psalm of fearless trust in God, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life, whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumble and fall. Throw host and camp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the days of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praise to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. And be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries. For false witness come rising against me, and such as breathed out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Yes. Let us pray. Oh God, we love you so much. We praise your almighty name. Lord of Lord, King of Kings, you are the almighty God. As we go into singing praises to you today, open our hearts to see how beautiful you are, all your beautiful ways. And as Brandon comes and reads your message, let us open our hearts to all the things you want us to see. And help us remember everything good and bad in our lives, Lord. All our trials, our pains, all our hard times. Remind us, Lord, that you are there with us through everything that we are going through and that you love us and that everything that happens is for our good and for the glory of your name. Thank you so much, Lord, for bringing your, your son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die for us so in the depths of our sins we could be redeemed and call you our almighty Father and praise our Lord Jesus Christ. And let us remember this one, one, one Sunday morning is better than a thousand elsewhere. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we do that, though, and before we let our children be dismissed, um, we're going to have a, a, just a prayer time um, for Daphne and Guinevere Robinson, who uh, this is their last Sunday, and they're heading up to, fam- some of the families already moved to Bend, Oregon, but Daphne and uh, Guinevere have been in our our student ministry and just as a part of our church uh, team kid uh, uh, camps for uh, many, many years, and we've just been so thankful for them. But we want to make sure that we as a church pray over them, let them know we love them, uh, and send them out with God's blessing. So I'm going to ask uh, us to stand together and pray, and I'm going to ask them to come forward. And if you are willing to come up and, and uh, pray with us here in front uh, over them, if you, if you know them well, come on up and do that. Uh, we'll pray for Daphne and for Guinevere. What an honor it is for us as a, the family of God to, to be doing this, to be part of this, right? This is just the family meeting together in, in our big, big living room and, uh, and praying for our, our sisters here today. All right, let's, uh, let's join together in prayer. Father, I, I'm so thankful um, that you have made us part of the family of God. And, and God, for whatever season that you, you allow us, that we are a part of this family of God, this body, uh, here in Mount Shasta. And we thank you so much for Daphne. We thank you for Guinevere. We thank you for the, uh, the life that they, they live and lead, Lord, the one that follows after you with all their heart. I thank you for uh, the ways that they have served within this body, God, and the ways that they have been served from this body and grown tremendously in their faith. 
God, we know that uh, as they head out, there's all kinds of different challenges and seasons in their life and, and, and amazing things also waiting for them. So God, we entrust them to you. We pray for them now that God, God you would go before them. God, just making, uh, making their path clear because God, they, they trust in you. They hope in you. God, we, uh, it's hard for us to let go. God, of, of friends and faithful people within our body, but Lord, we, we are letting them go in faith. We're trusting them to a good Savior, a good Lord. So God, make the transitions in the next uh, upcoming months uh, uh, good for them and smooth. God, may we continue to be used in their lives any way relationally or, uh, or practically that you would call us to be used. But Lord, we thank you for them. We pray for them. We give them to you. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you guys. All right, you can be seated. Our children can be dismissed to Children's Church now. And we'll bring our children back in a little while uh, after our sermon's over to uh, participate again in worship alongside of us. We, uh, we love it so much that our children can be part of, uh, of our, our family here, be part of a, the worship service, and, uh, and they can learn to give, and they can learn to worship, and they can learn to pray, and as they go out, they're going to learn, uh, kind of in their own language, the Word of God from capable teachers as well on their level. So we're thankful for that. Um, we are in Psalm chapter 43. If you would turn there in your Bible, I would certainly appreciate that. Psalm 43. We, uh, we're back in the Psalms. Some are in the Psalms. And uh, I know Hoyt preached on Psalm 42 a couple weeks ago. Last week, we spent a little time just talking about the Lord's Supper and took a pause uh, you know, we started the Psalms, we paused the Psalms, and now we're back again, all right? And we'll stay here for uh, several weeks and come and, and until we get into September. So uh, we're glad to be back here. Um, we are, uh, two weeks ago, Hoyt had preached on Psalm 42, and actually, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are likely one Psalm, or they were likely one Psalm. Uh, at the very least, they definitely go together. It was like a pause and then a uh, continued uh, thought from the same author. Um, and they, they carry the same theme. So um, I, I want us to understand what that theme is. And actually, the theme of many of the Psalms is this, but today's sermon title is uh, The Fight for a Satisfied Soul. The Fight for a Satisfied Soul. You'll see that on the sermon notes within the bulletin if you grabbed one of those as you came in. Um, and if you didn't, they're available uh, weekly on the kiosk. And uh, you can take notes maybe on the back of a piece of paper or a doodle sheet there if you'd like to in the P rack in front of you. But it is the fight for a satisfied soul. Uh, so today we're going to look more in depth at that and, and kind of what the psalm would teach us about that fight. Uh, but this, again, the psalms in general uh, have to do with a soul in turmoil and trying to find its satisfaction and peace in Jesus alone and God alone. So uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get into the Scripture and, uh, and break it apart. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, we pause to commit this time to you. We thank you that you brought us together this morning in unity as the church God, in order to worship our living Savior, Jesus Christ. But God, we also thank you that you brought us together in unity to, to sit under your word, that we would be taught by it and we would grow to, to love you more and God, to, to hate our sin more and God, and to reject the things of this world and the, and the gods that uh, it offers. God, and to turn instead to you as our ultimate satisfaction. So we give our time to you now. We ask that you would teach us. We ask that you would humble our hearts, open our hearts and our minds to be receptive. We ask that your spirit would lead us and guide us, that you would convict us of any sin and move us to a place of repentance and faith and faithfulness to you, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in your name we pray, amen. All right, we're in Psalm 43. I'm gonna read the entire Psalm and then we'll, we'll break it apart. Vindicate me, God, and champion my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and unjust person. For you are the God of my refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's opposition? Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain to your dwelling place. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God, my greatest joy. I will praise you with a lyre, God, my God. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior, 
and my God. It is the word of God. So today as we, we look through this, again, these Psalm 42 and, and 41, and you can read this more on your own at, uh, at, at home and kind of go through Psalm 42 and 41. Uh, we'll look at some of the texts from that uh, from the previous week, but they are likely one song. And, uh, and what we see is someone that's struggling not only with the circumstances around them, but, but here's what's most important to understand. The struggle was not so much with just the circumstances around them, but most paramount, they were struggling within themselves, fighting to be satisfied in their soul, struggling to find the place where they would have peace. And so I think for you and I, it's very important that we approach the text and the Word of God like that today. You, you might be all about your circumstances and what happened last week or what happened yesterday or what happened this morning when you're trying to get ready for church or in the car ride to church. I know, you're all chuckling. Satan does it the morning of all the time, okay? So, so for us, uh, we, we have these circumstances in our life, like how, how can I fix this? And really, I want us to pause and I want us to reflect and I want us to consider what is the struggle going on right inside of me right now? And where, where am I to look for peace and for hope? And not just to have my circumstances satisfied, but to find real satisfaction in my heart and in my soul. The psalmist here realizes that peace is not only found in the Lord, or it's found only in the Lord and not in, in that psalmist's expectations in life or his circumstances. His hopes we see have been shattered. His prayers were seemingly unanswered. His enemies were pressing in and his feelings were more than he could handle. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Called life. Amen? Let me read that again. Hopes shattered, prayers seemingly unanswered, enemies seem to be pressing in and my feelings are more than I can bear. That was called yesterday. Amen? It's just life. It, it, it happens all around us. But God, but God. For some of you who went to Wild Adventure Camp this, uh, this last couple uh, weeks ago, right? What was the theme? But God, right? That is something that I have talked about for many, many years from this pulpit and in my teaching. In fact, so much so that someone in this church uh, bot had made a little placard that says, but God, and I have it on my shelf in my office. Right? When the struggles come up, when my hopes are shattered, when prayers seem unanswered, when my enemies are pressing in, when my feelings are more than I can bear, what do I need to reflect on? But God. What the psalmist understood and learned was that God was still on his throne. And the psalmist realized that God was present with him and would be the joy of his heart and he could still worship God no matter where he was. See, in the Psalm 42, we see a, a psalmist who was probably a Levite who wanted to be in the temple, who wanted to take people on that pilgrimage back to the sanctuary and worship God there. And, and he, because of his exile, was not able to do that. His circumstances prevented him. The oppression prevented him. And he wanted that to be over so he could go back. But he realized, I can worship wherever I am. And, and here's, here's the important part we found a couple weeks ago in Psalm 42. While we wait, while we wait for the, the dawning of a new day, God will give us his songs in the night to comfort our troubled heart. And that's the promise we see, and we see in Psalm 42 8. We'll look at it in a few minutes, but we see that throughout the scripture. So, as we look at this text today, we are looking at how do we fight for a satisfied soul? So, let's look at number one. Number one is this How do we fight for a satisfied soul? Number one, talk and be honest with God. Talk and be honest with God. Now, if I'm talking and being honest to you, a lot of the scriptures talk and honesty seems like whining to me. Would you agree? I mean, I, sometimes I read the Psalms and I'm like, oh my gosh, another one. It's like, are you whining again? And I, I reflect on that. I'm like, I'm whining about their whining. So I don't really have any room, do I? You understand how that goes? It's like, stop that. And it's like trying to be tolerant. Like, I, you're not tolerant. You're intolerant. And I'm, what am I being? Not tolerant of your intolerance. It, it continues to go and it goes right back to the heart and needing a satisfied heart. So talk and be honest with God. Let's look at verse, uh, verses 1 and 2 in Psalm chapter 42. And, and again, you'll see this in tons of Psalms and in Lamentations. Uh, we'll see the honesty we see from, uh, from the writers, from the heart. What's the psalmist say? Vindicate me, God, and, and champion my cause against an unfaithful nation. Now pause there for a minute. A lot of whining starts in the heart because we, we feel like our cause has been interrupted. You understand? You see what he says there? Vindicate me and champion what? 
my cause. God, I want you to get on board with what I'm doing, and you're not. And what I wanted to have happen is not occurring, so I'm frustrated with that. God, champion my cause against an unfaithful nation. He throws it in there. Certainly, God will champion my cause because it's against these heathens that he despises. Okay, He says, rescue me from the deceitful and unjust person. And then he goes in, he says, for God, you are a God of my refuge. I, I, I have refuge in you. I, and, and we can read this different ways, but, but as I prepared this week, this is how I read it. The psalmist was like, I, I'm, I'm in God. I'm God's person. I have refuge in him, so he's going to champion my cause. Look what he says. He, he, he thinks that, but then he has to ask the question. It begs the question in verse 2. God, God, you're the God of my refuge, but why have you rejected me? You, you turned your back on me. You ever feel like that? God, where are you? Where are you, God? So much so, keep going. It says, oh, why have you rejected me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? There's a rough circumstance going on, and oftentimes the circumstances are built because of our, our kind of our own agenda, right? My cause. The question comes down really is, where, where is God here? Where is God? If we were to look in Psalm 42, just if you're looking at this text, Psalm 42 is right before Psalm 43. In verse 3, says, my tears, he's again being honest with God, my tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, what? Where is your God? Where is your God? I mean, it's, it's so true that our, our emotional like, state goes in such, a, such disarray and chaos when our circumstances change that what it shows to the world is that circumstances are what we trust in, and when they go awry and we go awry, they're like, where's your God? And I think for me, it's more of a rebuke. God's saying, where's your faith in God? Where's your trust? God's not far. God's like, I'm not far from you. You're, you're far from me in the, in the satisfaction of your soul. You're trying to find it in your cause. In verse 3, though, they, the question is, where is your God? And so there's this honesty that happens, and, which, is a, which is great. And, and, and sometimes what has to happen is, and, and I've seen this so many times, we kind of have to hear our own heart speak. Psalm 77, verses 4 through 9. He says, You have kept me from closing my eyes. I'm troubled and cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long past. At night, I remember my music. I meditate in my heart, and my spirit ponders. And here's what, what the spirit, what does your spirit ponder? Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? This is a common theme, isn't it? Where is God? Will you reject me forever? But there's this. In this attitude, he says, his, has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Is he in anger? Is, 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 has his anger withheld his compassion? This is the psalmist. What is the psalmist saying? I'm not, I'm not feeling you right now, God. I don't see you right now. I'm, I'm struggling, and it's, and it's real. And sometimes we, we read that and see, you might have you ever experienced this? Like someone would come to you and whine, right? Just really, actually, lament. Let's just call it lament. That's what it really is. Like from their heart, they're really struggling. They're like, I, "I'm struggling right now. I don't feel God. I don't see God. I don't know what He's up to." And and you you hear that, and, and you're like, and sometimes you're like, you know, have they not been watching or something? Have they not been seeing how God works? And 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 sometimes it's refreshing. You get to point that out, doesn't it? Don't, isn't it nice? But listen, they're they're not different than you and I. Those people who come with a lament and they're, they're being honest with you and you're like, I don't get it. I don't see how you've missed God here, right? There's an honesty that, to that. But you know what's, a, what's really refreshing is, is when we are honest with God. And I think that, that you might feel a certain way right now. You might be struggling a certain way right now. You might, not, you might feel like God's far from you. Go and tell him that. Because so many times when people have come and lamented to me or talked to me and said it out loud, by the time they've done, been done speaking, they're like, that sounds silly, doesn't it? Because when we hear ourselves speak, what we're hearing is what our heart has believed. And we can almost say, heart, that was wrong. You, you missed something there. There's something else that's true, and, and, and you know it. How, even your friends, this is true about just what we believe in general. I, I've talked to so many people about Jesus or about faith or about their faith journey and and they, they believe something they believe jesus isn't the way and they believe something else but they haven't really articulated it so i ask them hey can you tell me about this 
And as they're speaking, they're like, I don't, I'm not sure if that makes sense. You think? Yeah, maybe not. So it's really good for us to speak it out loud, to be honest with God and, and let our heart, that trouble of our heart, be put out in the open and on the table and, and let, let us see what our heart is really believing because when we do that, I think that it'll wake up in us something about who God really is and that my agenda and my, and my cause is not what God should be holding on as his cause. There's something refreshing and can be healing about being honest with God and, and saying it out loud. Your heart has a chance to hear what it believes, right? In, in chapter 42, if you look just over there one more time, uh, he's, he's pondering and really thinking through, God, where are you? What's going on? You're, I, I need you. And then in verse 8, there's kind of this pivot point in Psalm 42 because he changes how he addresses God. He, instead of addressing God as Elohim, he addresses God as a, as a very much more specific Yahweh. And Yahweh is like God, I, the Lord, Yahweh, in verse 8, will send his faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night. A prayer, uh, a prayer to the God of my life. He, he, he says, you know what? Of all these questions, of all these unanswered questions that I have, of all these weird things I might be believing from my heart, you are Yahweh. And, and he's not just saying you're God. He's saying you are the faithful covenant God who has an enduring hesed love, an enduring love for us that will never run out, will never fail, you'll never disappoint, your promises will always come to be. That's what he's claiming. That's what he's preaching to his heart. He's saying, it's Yahweh. This is God. This is the God of gods who cares and will never turn his covenant back away from us. His covenant love will always be towards those who have believed in him. Isn't it true, though, that those, are, those turning points are difficult for us? We have to acknowledge, right, and acknowledge that maybe my agenda shouldn't have been the agenda of the day and that God really has this figured out. What was he acknowledging? He acknowledged that God was the God of the covenant. He was a faithful God who cares for his people, who, who showers his people with loving kindness. He's a God who is worthy to be praised and worthy to be trusted. He had realized he didn't have to go back to Jerusalem to worship. He could worship right where he was. And the hand of God was with him, not only in the daytime, but the song of God and the hand of God was with him in the night as well, and he was comforted from that. Verse, verse 8 again, Lord uh, will send his faithful love by day, and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to God, uh, the God of my life. And that, that's a lot different than saying my tears have been my food day and night. It, they were. He was restless and sleepless and despairing and depressed. But he says, no, God is faithful. And, and God, your faithfulness, your covenant love for me, that, that will be the song for me in the night. That's what will give me peace and assurance in the night. And even though everything around him might be shaken and changing, the Lord was still on his throne and the Lord would, Lord would still be his rock. And what is a rock but stable and strong and unchanging? Psalm 77 goes on, verse 11 to 12. You ask that, where is God? He said, I will remember. Oh, he said, oh, yeah, I remember. I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all that you have done and meditate on your actions. See, when we're honest with God and we, we say it out loud what our heart believes, our heart begins to, to change. Our heart begins to soften and realize and remember, oh, oh yeah, Yahweh, God, the covenant God, he, is, he has not left me. He has not although I, I might feel far from him and I might feel he's far from me. He is not. He is right there. And his wonders and his works are known to me. I can look back. I can reflect on all the ways that God has worked in my life and I will use that as the meditation of my heart and the song of my heart in the night and I'll reflect on that. And I will, I will begin to find peace in that. I'll find that satisfaction in my soul. And I build all of this to, to kind of culminate in this section, at least in Philippians chapter four. And this is what Paul says. He says, don't worry about anything. Thanks, Paul. You usually see that and we're like, ah, I'm going to skip on. I'm, I'm worried already, right? Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, right, honest, open dialogue with God. But there's a, a little word here we kind of skip over. It kind of just seems like it's out of place in the, in the way the passage flows. It says, but in everything, through prayer and petition, we would think, make your requests known to God. 
But he says, with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You know what that means, that thanksgiving part? In order to be thankful for what God has done, you and I have to what? Remember what He's done. Recall what, what He's done. Re- reflect on how good and gracious and loving God is. What it means is that as we come before God in honesty with our prayers and our petitions, we say, God, this is my honest heart. We get to that point where I was honest and I, I shared with it and I heard how, what my heart believes. What I have to do is reflect then on who has God been? I, I might believe this. I might think this. I might be feeling this. But who has God been in my life? And then as I remember who God has been and reflect on who God has been, I can approach him not only with my prayers and my petitions of God, this is how I feel, but I can come to him with thanksgiving saying, but you are God and you are good. And what does Paul continue to say the promise is? That you come with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In verse 7 it says, and the peace of God. Not like a part of God, the peace, but the peace, the, the satisfaction, the, the, the quiet, quiet pressure release for us. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the promise. Right? Isn't that amazing? That, that this, this peace, this desire for, for finding satisfaction in my soul and fighting for satisfaction in my soul comes from being honest with God and then reflecting in thanksgiving for who He has always been and trusting that, that He's going to do it again. And I may not know how, it may not be the way I thought and my cause, but I'm going to wait on the Lord and I'm going to trust in what He is going to bring. Because what He's going to bring is a peace that surpasses all understanding. Don't you want to go to sleep easy like that tonight? Peace that surpasses understanding. No more tears that just go and go and go. I just want the song of the Lord and I want Him to be my peace. That's what He's promised. The fight for a satisfied soul begins with being honest and realizing what your heart really believes. And then remembering with thanksgiving who God is and what He has done for you. And He will bring His peace. Amen? Number two, as the psalmist goes on in Psalm 43, the fight for a satisfied soul We are to choose to be led by God. We are to choose. If you want to fight for a satisfied soul, then you and I need to choose to be led by Him. It's not about my cause anymore. Remember we talked about that a minute ago. It's like, God, champion my cause. Let's look at verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 43. It says, send, what did he say? What's he pray? Send what? Your. There's this switch between verse 2 and verse 3. He's like, oh, wait a minute. I just, I just was honest and I heard what my heart believes. Time out, whoa. Let me approach God differently now. And he says, God, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain. God, I have an agenda. I have a cause. It's my, I'm just, I want you to champion my cause, but it's not working out. My heart believes that, that I should be in t- turmoil about that. But, but wait, I should be at peace because of who God is and what he's done already. So what I'm going to do is change my thoughts and say, God, why don't you send me your light? Why don't you send me your truth? Why don't you help me see this from your perspective instead of my perspective? Send me your light and your truth, and I want to be led by them. Verse 4, then I will come to the altar of God, my greatest joy. To God, my greatest joy. This is a far cry from his cause being his greatest joy. And that's what it was, right? When, when, it, when something like my cause or my circumstances or my preferences in life, like, like this is how I thought things should go, when that becomes your greatest joy, God wanes as your greatest joy. And what God wants is not to wane as your greatest joy. God wants to win as your greatest joy. Now, God will always be the God of our greatest joy. But if our affections turn from him to something else, how can he satisfy? And if he's not there to satisfy because we've pushed him away and put something else in its place, we will not have a soul that is satisfied either. We have to say, God, I'm going to yield. I'm going to pause. and I'm not, I'm not just going to yield like, see what you're doing. I want you to bring your light and your truth, and that will be what leads me. Church, what is that? What, what is he yielding to? What, what should we yield to? 
His what? His purpose. Found where? In the Word of God and by the power of His Spirit. And the Spirit and the Word will never contradict each other. We can always find that confirmation there. When you and I are struggling with championing our cause, we don't know which way to go, right or left. Where do we go? We go to the Word of God. <clears throat> and the Word of God is God's cause, and it champions His cause for us. And we are choosing then to say, I'm going to yield my cause to His cause because He is ultimately satisfied. That's where we yield. We yield our heart to Him. I want to be led by Him. We see that in Psalm 61. God, hear my cry. Pay attention to my prayer. I, I call to you from the ends of the earth when my heart is without strength. And same kind of thing, kind of a lament. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm weak. But he, he goes in and says, lead me, God. Lead me. I don't want to do this on my own anymore. Lead me to a rock that's higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower in the face of my enemies. I will dwell in your tent forever and take refuge under the shelter of your wings. This, this is the answer for us, is to, to seek to be led by God and find satisfaction there and shelter there and, and dwelling there and refuge there. And where does that come from? It comes from real trust, real faith, saying, God, you are the greatest gift I could ever receive. I'm going to, to, to make you that gift. I'm going to trust that you are that gift. It comes to, to really dwelling with him and not just like on the weekends I add God in. It's like, no, he is my dwelling place, my safe place every single moment of every single day. He is a real refuge for my soul. And when that happens, we find real satisfaction in him. He wants to be led by God. But I want us to, to not forget something else. As I, as I studied through this, I'm like, yeah, we want to seek God. You should lead me. You should lead me. I want to be led by you. Yield my heart to you. Sometimes, though, we feel vulnerable doing that. Because we don't feel like we're not in control. Or we're, not, we're not able to, to handle maybe what comes up next. I'm not sure exactly. And, and the question really comes up is, like, do we really trust God? And, and I can go further that, like, does God really have my back? And Brandon, you say you want me to be led by God, but who's watching out behind me? Or what's, come, what's that? The Lord God. Psalm 26. So with it, He's not only going to be a guide that, we, that leads us. Psalm 26 or 23.6. Right, so the 23rd Psalm, he says, only goodness and mercy or faithful love will what? Follow me, pursue me. I like that word, pursue me, not just follow. It's not like he's lagging behind there. Like, no, he's pursuing behind, like I'm right there. Goodness and faithful love, mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I shall live. He's not only a guide that we can let lead us he comes and pursues us with his goodness and his faithful love. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? He goes down in verse 11, Because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. The fight for a satisfied soul takes, takes a soul that yields to the Lord as a guide and as a rear guard for us. And that's, that sounds satisfying, doesn't it? That sounds, that sounds like I can have some peace because of that. Finally, number three. <clears throat> if you want to fight for a satisfied soul, you have to preach to yourself. You have to preach to yourself. You look in the mirror and say, self, get your act together. Self, you rely on God. Self, you trust in God. What's the psalmist say? And he's repeating this the third time. That's why 42 and 43 go together. We see it in verse 5 of Psalm 32, or 42. We see it in verse 11 of Psalm uh, 42. And now we see it in verse 5 of Psalm 43. What does he say? Why, my soul? He looks at himself. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? What's he saying? Layman's terms. Stop whining so much about you. What are you worried about? Why are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? He says, put your hope in God, for I will praise Him, my Savior and my God. You see, there is hope and there is satisfaction only in a Savior. Our Savior and our God. 
And he's mighty to save. He, he sees you not only in your circumstances of your life and, and what's going on, and you can trust in him, but, but for your soul, that's an eternal thing, right? This is, this is the part of the conversation that goes beyond my daily living, looking in the mirror, and preaching to myself. This goes into the, the mirror that is an eternal mirror, a kingdom mirror, that if I really was being honest and looked into it, I would see sinful human beings separated from God because of my sin. That's what we see. That's the reality. And because of my sin, there is no peace with God. I've, I've separated myself from God. I can't be with him as much as I want him to be in my refuge. I can't accept that but God, right? But God, while we were still sinners, sent Christ to die for you and for your sin and for me and my sin. That if we would believe in the Lord Jesus, we would receive him as Savior, we would confess our sins to him and let him forgive us and wipe us clean, white as snow, that he would be faithful and just to forgive us. And that he would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he would give us real satisfaction for our soul. This is soul talk, amen? This is not just regular everyday talk for my life and my body and my flesh. This is soul talk. Satisfaction in the soul comes from a Savior who is mighty to save. So you preach to yourself. Maybe it needs to say, why am I rejecting Jesus? Why are you rejecting Jesus? You look in the mirror and say, stop running away from Jesus. Stop thinking you can do it on your own. Put your trust and your hope in Him. Accept Him as Savior and Lord. Repent of your sin. Turn away from your idols, your own gods. You'll never get there on your own. Preach to yourself. Let the Word of God tell you what is right and what is not. And receive Him as Savior. And once you have, we still need to preach to ourselves because we still live in this life of despair and sorrow and upheaval, and, and we still fight the flesh and fight the, 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 the desire for God to champion my cause. We preach to ourselves and say that you'll never find satisfaction there. Stop championing your cause and trust in the Lord. Trust and be led by Him. We preach to ourselves. Paul says in Corinthians that we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, to obey Christ. The author of Hebrews says, let us, let's hold firmly. This is what we should preach to ourselves, that we would hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Why can we hold firmly onto this confession of hope? Because he, Jesus, who promised is faithful with our soul. I want to read a quote from uh, a commentary from this week. It's actually a quote in the commentary of Martin Lloyd-Jones. And uh, here's what he says regarding these two psalms. He says, I suggest the main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression, in a sense, is this. Thumbs it up nicely for us. Ready? That we allow ourselves to talk to us instead of talking to ourself. You have to take yourself in the hand and you have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. This self of ours, this other man within us, has got to be handled. Do not listen to him, turn to him, speak to him, con uh, or uh, do not listen to him. Instead, turn to him, speak to him, condemn him, upbraid him, exhort him, encourage him, remind him of what you know instead of listening placidly to him and allowing him to drag you down and depress you. Get a handle on yourself. Handle him important that we preach to ourselves psalm 27 8 my heart says this about you he's preaching my heart is saying this about you seek his face my heart's telling me seek his face lord i will seek your face don't we need to do that self seek his face all right seek his face i'm going to seek his face he says, lord i'll seek your face verse 13 says i am certain that i will see the lord's goodness in the land of the living you see when we seek his face we're saying he is trustworthy and that you're going to find him. You're going to find satisfaction. I'm certain I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. So, uh, verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be and while you do, here, here's what you're preaching to yourself. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Man, what a sermon to preach to myself when I get up in the morning. What a sermon to preach myself halfway through the day. What a sermon to preach to myself uh, when I'm getting anxious at the night before I go to bed and I look in the mirror. What a sermon to preach to myself. I would hold on to him and find satisfaction in my soul. 
I'd also preach what Psalm, 80, Psalm 86 says, for you, Lord, you, Lord, are kind and you're ready to forgive. You're abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. That's what we preach, God, you're abounding. The <laughs> soul, God, is abounding in faithful love to all who call on him. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cries for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Lord, as we preach to ourselves again, Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, little g gods, and there are no works like yours. What a reminder for us to have to give ourselves. There's no God like our God. There's no works like his. I want to finish with Lamentations chapter 3. This passage of Scripture is, is a lament, right? Lamentations is lamenting, and I, I think it takes us through the entire progression of, of despair and then a progression of remembrance and a, then a progression of preaching to ourselves. So I want to read that. Lamentations 3, 17 through 24. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. And then I, I thought my future is lost as well as my hope from the Lord. Verse 19, remember my affliction and my homelessness, the, the wormwood and the poison. That's pretty rough times, right? I continually remember them and have become depressed. Yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. There's remembrance here, reflection. What does he call to mind? He says this, verse 22, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, I say, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in Him. Only someone with a satisfied soul could say the Lord is my portion and be able to hope in Him. I'm going I'm to finish with a story. And we're going to sing together. In 1871, Horatio Spafford, a wealthy business owner and faithful supporter of the evangelist D.L. Moody, lost his entire livelihood as well as his four-year-old son in the Chicago fire. Now, not long after that event, as he began to rebuild his business, he boarded his wife and his four daughters on a boat to head to Europe for a vacation. And he planned to finish up some business and to meet them there shortly after. Tragically, he never saw his daughters again. The ship they were on wrecked, and his wife alone was saved. After that event, Spafford chose to write these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. The words of this hymn, It is well with my soul, are some of the most comforting ever written, and it should be our prize and our position and our stance every single day. And don't have it well with my soul, that is only found through the hope and faith that we put in Jesus Christ. Amen? Hope you can find and that we will together fight have our soul be satisfied in him would you stand with me as we pray and then go into a time of reflective responsive worship father you alone are worthy and god there are so many times in our lives that that god we we want to champion our cause and we we feel like our agenda is being destroyed or distracted or disrupted but god help us lead us lead us to the rock that is higher than i and let us fix our eyes on you. Let us, let us find real satisfaction for our souls in you. You are a good and gracious God. You are a God of the covenant God, a God that, that extends his, his faithful, good, merciful love to us every single day. Your, mer your mercies are new every morning. We put our trust in you. God, help us. Help us to preach to ourselves. I think that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. Give ourselves a pep talk and walk us back to being led by you being guarded by you to find hope in you and joy in you and strength in you. We thank you that you are an anchor for our soul. 
And we thank you that, God, whatever our lot, whether, whether it is peace or whether it is sea billows all around, that we can say through faith in Jesus Christ that it is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name.